Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of MK Macro and Markets. Today we have with us uh, Ms. Madhvi Arora, who is the lead economist in the Institutional Equities Desk at uh, MK Research. Hi Madhvi, great to have you here. Prevailing narrative last year was about inflation. All over the world, we've seen double digit inflation in DM economies, which was probably the first time in you know decades. India, of course, was not spared as well. But coming into 2023, we're already seeing inflation ease off a little bit in some cases and a lot in other cases. Uh, so what do you think is going to be the path of inflation for in 2023? Will it be disinflation? Will it be deflation? Or, you know, could we even see inflation coming back in some form or the other? So you're right. So last year, clearly what we saw was a very sharp, uh, you know, inflation upswing, which was not expected by most of us in the early part of last year. But we did see inflation coming off also as we ended the year. And it was largely led by core goods uh, inflation, uh, which is a phenomenon we saw in the West, which is also spilling over back home as well. Uh, a large part of that is, of course, on account of the fact that you are no longer seeing the supply constraints on goods as such. One. And two, uh, the world demand is normalizing from goods to services. So obviously, the, the upshot of uh, uh, high savings that we saw in the West, which essentially went to goods because supply of uh, services were constrained, is now normalizing, which is implying that the goods demand itself is coming off, irrespective of whether the global demand is uh, you know, weakening or not. So I think that narrative will continue as we get into the next year, uh, or get, we are into the next year rather. Uh, and more importantly, uh, you are going to be seeing a big curtailment of uh, global demand because of the constrained monetary policy that we are in, the kind of rate hikes that we have seen in the last uh, uh, eight, nine months uh, across the world is going to tighten your financial conditions uh, uh, as well and will eventually uh, sort of kill demand. So there is no two way about the fact that you will see uh, you know, a disinflationary trend. Uh, now the question remains whether you are going to be seeing an inflation downtick to the extent that uh, you know it comes below the or around the central bank's target of two percent across the globe. That I think will still be a uh, you know a, const a problem for the central banks to sort of take care of because even though you see a big disinflationary wave uh, you know playing uh, during the next few months or so, partly on account of the base effect, partly on account of the fact that you will see demand destruction also happening, but you will also have certain constraints with regard to supply of say labor in the west which is going to be a long term problem as we go ahead and that structural problem will itself mean that one uh, factor of production will remain expensive as you go ahead so and at the same time uh, you also are seeing the sheltered inflation which is now coming off to still remain very high during the year to the extent that it you know it uh, still sort of um, obstruct the uh, the inflation to come off below 2% so that kind of trend for me uh, makes me believe that you know, probably you're not going to be seeing inflation coming off to below 3.5% uh, by end of this year in the US. And to some extent, those constraints are actually visible across the West. And, to, and countries like India anyway have been having a very sticky service inflation, which will be a problem even next year. So for India as well, we're looking at inflation coming off to uh, around 5% or 5.2% rather, uh, which uh, still is a higher uh, print than what RBI would like to see on an average, which is a 4 or sub 4%. So I think uh, as we see disinflation wave play out, uh, the uh, disinflation uh, reversal or reversal of inflation will be still incomplete to the extent that we probably will see a structurally high inflation as we go ahead into the next few years or so, which could also be contributed by the fact that you are moving to a greenflationary environment, you are moving to a world which is going to be fiscally more uh, irresponsible because you know you have to take care of the pension uh, pain uh, which the government will have to bear in their budgets as uh, as well as you are also seeing a part of semi deglobalization if not a full deglobalization which is which uh, which probably could make it more expensive for the world to produce the same kind of goods and services that they were producing say a decade ago so i think all of it to some extent makes me believe that you are in a relatively higher inflation regime than what you saw in the last decade that said, uh, there is no two way about the fact that 2023 would be a year of disinflation, but incomplete disinflation from my end. Obviously, inflation is higher in DMs than it is in India at the moment. And that inflation differential also therefore has an impact on the currency. Now, uh, of course, we've seen the rupee go as low as 83 and now it's sort of rebounded to 81 and a half or so in the last few days. The DXY, which is the dollar index, went as high as 114 is now sort of again re come back down to 108, 109 or so. So there's been sharp movements in the currency as well, of course, globally, but we are, uh, and in India as well. So 
with regard to this now where do you see the currency going this year in terms of the movement i think uh, well rupee has enjoyed the dollar weakness what you saw in the rupee retracement essentially is a reflection of what you saw in dx as you mentioned uh, which to some extent is also um, sort of uh, being led by the fact that the market is largely pricing in a last rate hike by the us fed while the rest of the developed markets uh, uh, notably ecb and even bank of england and even bank of japan for that matter are still lagging and they are going to catch up in the next uh, 3 to 6 months or so so that so called interest differential that uh, us was enjoying against its dm peers will narrow so that i think is playing against the dollar and uh, emerging market currencies across the world have enjoyed the dollar uh, you know a uh, weakness and have gained across in rupee has been no outlier in that front either um at the same time uh, em asian currencies particularly have also gained because uh, of the china reopening uh, you know uh, momentum which helped the cnh which helped the currencies which trade with china and does india also again had a spillover on that front so i think uh, uh, we saw the rupee rally to an 81 8150 is uh, essentially on account of these two factors plus to some extent rbi was also absent uh, apparently absent rather is what uh, i understand which means that uh, rupee has found a new support at 81 ish now the next debate that all of us are having around is that whether it is going to touch 80 or below uh, my sense is that um, you know india has structural problem of a higher fiscal and current account deficit uh, and uh, to the extent that this year we are looking at the cat to correct to a 2.6 2.7 percent of gdp for fy24 but an absolute level it will still be a very high number of close to 100 billion dollars so that funding pressure will certainly be uh, a pain for the indian uh, economy in general uh, partly because you are seeing incremental fdi flow sort of slowing fpi flows will also be a challenge because the kind of carry that you're giving to the foreign investors which is going to be much lesser than probably other em peers will also uh, constrain the amount of uh, debt flows or even general return on uh, our asset classes uh, relatively more a uh, less uh, lucrative for foreign investors so i think to that extent the funding pressure will probably be a pain for uh, us and that will reinforce in the rupee in some form or the other and uh, to that extent i personally believe that rbi may uh, you know will at least will keep a watch on uh, their monetary policy tightening regime because as of now most of us are believing that we are ending the rate hike cycle in february uh, uh, which will be ending at 6.5% uh, on a repo rate uh but we'll have to see how the asset classes actually perform back home for them to be able to take a call that uh, they are done for uh, for the moment um and of course that you can even see in their own policy discussions uh, at least when you see the mpc split the internal members of the monetary policy committee which is rbi guys seem to have a much hawkish stance on the on the whole uh, in you know the monetary policy regime partly because they just don't have to manage the monetary policy for them it's also the financial a uh, stability of the economy in general of which rupee plays a very important part and that sort of explains their uh, hawkish bias versus uh, the external members of mpc who are relatively more uh, you know uh, sort of dovish in their stance at this point in time uh, so of course uh, you know we are now entering the budget period so we'll have to see uh, the fiscal consolidation path that the government really play uh, puts across because that will have a reinforcing effect on the current account deficit and we could again get in the chain of full twin deficit which will be a problem for the currency uh so, but this year i think uh, i am not looking at rupee going below 80 uh in the near term i think uh, pretty much an 81 to 80 350 could be a range of course you'll have a march end effect which will be positive for the currency but on a broad basis i think structurally rupee uh, should ideally have a weaker bias we may have the tactical moves in currency here and there but on a more secular basis i think uh, uh, it's difficult to envisage a very strong rupee right and you mentioned monetary policy there but you've also spoken about the budget which is coming up so the interplay between monetary and fiscal policy obviously also becomes important especially when monetary policy is tightening fiscal right. policy so far has been slightly loose but it is now also obviously going to need to tighten because of the deficit uh, right. where we are at so having said that how do you see that playing out and therefore you know i'll also add on to ask what do you expect from the budget which is coming up um so india clearly has uh, the worst uh, fiscal profile uh, in the emerging market uh, uh, complex and that is what it what explains uh, our uh, relatively low um, credit rating as a sovereign 
the only reason we we lacked against uh, our peers is basically we have a very high consolidated fiscal deficit which is close to 9.5 to 10% of gdp and funding of that always has remained a problem for us and will remain one uh, uh, as we get into the next year simply because we are no longer sitting with a surplus of household or corporates which which was funding uh, our fiscal to some extent until very recently and which also had helped the current account remain little less a uh, bit of a pain and actually uh, to some extent the bop also in surplus now when there's a reversal of uh, domestic savings happening the pressure will be even more on uh, the funding in general be it the fiscal funding or be it the external funding so to that extent there is no two way about the fact that you will have to see a fiscal consolidation continuing uh, this year the government had the benefit of very high tax buoyancy which was not priced in by even the government or some of us to that some extent which was able to take care of the slippage that you saw in the uh, revenue expenditure side which is largely led by food and fertilizer subsidies uh, uh, we are comfortably going to be seeing an our government of india printing a 6.4% fiscal deficit for fy23 which is what they budgeted and uh, to that uh, from that starting point i think you should be able to see at least a 0.5 to 0.6 percentage point correction in fiscal deficit fy24 which means you should see a 5.8 to 5.9% of fiscal deficit as a percent of gdp by fy24 so the the path itself is very clear that they are moving towards a consolidation and they don't really have a choice in that front uh, of course we'll have to see how the consolidated fiscal numbers look once once the states also come out with their budget numbers which happens in you know in march and april uh, so that itself uh, i think uh, needs to be seen in a more holistic way not just from the center's point of view but uh, at least the directional path is very clear because that is reinforcing or refeeding into your very high def, uh, debt to gdp ratio and uh, there is still no clear path as to how they would bring it down to a 40% for the center and, and total uh, 60% or around that as a percent of gdp for center plus state that's a long way to go because you already had cross a 90% plus post pandemic and of course you've corrected from there but still the path is going to be a very long one and uh to for that to be achieved your fiscal consolidation has to be consistently done at the same time you need to have a very strong growth story because in the end everything matters everything is uh, sort of derived by your percentage of gdp right so everything looks optically okay if, if your growth is happening uh, the underlying is happening very well so i think that that needs to be somewhere supported so when you look or talk about the fiscal consolidation uh the policy aim which i think the government struggled last year also and will struggle in the coming years as well is to not only consolidate but consolidate in a fashion that the fiscal multiplier still remain high your growth multipliers are good your uh, employment generation also uh, you know happens uh, despite the fact that you are tightening your fiscal policy in general so how, where do you use the impulse the most that is where the whole question comes out to be we have any expenditure or capital capital expenditure where in the capital expenditure side where in the revenue expenditure side so this year they're going to be saving their uh, money on food and fertilizer because uh, you know the subsidy amount will likely be much lower than last year and that could be really allocated to uh, you know other sectors within the revenue expenditure which is basically rural and uh, agriculture welfare which they had sort of not Uh, given a very high allocation in the last two or three years, if I see on an average, so there could be reallocation within the revenue expenditure. I'm not looking at a very populist budget, uh, but we're also expecting, despite the uh, the consolidation, you will still see uh, some growth in total expenditure in general, uh, single digit of course, uh, and the capital to GDP ratio or capex to GDP ratio should ideally go up from what we saw in the last couple of years. So this year we are expecting them to print around 2.8 percent of uh, GDP worth of capital expenditure as a percent of GDP. which i think will uh, will go up further next year uh, at the margin though uh, but at the same time this is going to be much higher than what you saw in the pre pandemic year which was around 1.5% of gdp so they've already almost doubled from a pre pandemic average to the current print that they will be uh, showing in the budget so there's a clear uh, shift in policy uh, priorities uh, in terms of putting their money more towards capital expenditure which is obviously having a much higher productive impact in the medium term if not an immediate impact but we obviously have also have a 
budget uh, sorry uh, elections coming in uh, uh, CY24. So the policy makers will keep that in mind as well. So there will be a bit of populist uh, you know agenda here and there partly on account of uh, the fact that you are seeing a weaker rural economy in general. So there could be a bias towards how to improve the rural employment because that is what is a sustainable way of increasing the rural demand in general. You know you can give SOPs but that will not have a multiplier effect. The only way you can have a sustainable increase in the demand or trend, uh, trend impro improvement in demand is by actually giving people employment. So I think non-agriculture segment will be the more focused one. We'll see Manrega allocation how they really pan out. Uh, there's still a decent Manrega demand which shows that uh, the rural employment problem is pretty much uh, visible. Uh, at the same time, they could also try and play a little bit on the taxation bit. Uh, they could be tinkering on the personal tax uh, regime, the, the a new regime that they had introduced two year, three years ago, which hasn't seen much traction as yet. So there could be some uh, tinkering around that fact. Capital gain taxes as well across asset classes are being talked about, you know, how they'll make it more uniform. So those tinkerings will be there, but I think the bigger uh, challenge for them is to essentially increase the revenue expenditure. Uh, without disturbing their fiscal math in general. So that I think would be a challenge. Of course, CAPEX will remain a focus. Uh, I'll also watch for uh, any kind of special allocation towards energy transition. They had talked about it last year as well uh, and obviously increase the allocation, but especially given the fact that they are now getting into, they are you know in the G20 presidency uh, uh, mode, probably they could have a relatively higher bias or noise around you know the energy transition uh, budget. So we'll see, but uh, I think on a broad basis, consolidation is something that they can't really afford to, uh, you know, be relaxed about. Two, uh, the fiscal multipliers need to be still strong despite their correction, and three, how they actually end up funding it without troubling their uh, math, budget math, and the borrowing pressure which will come on the bond market. So I think we will be seeing a very high borrowing this year to the extent of around more than 12 lakh crore on net basis, uh, which clearly will be a pressure for them to fund. So I think uh, you know we'll have to balance those pressures some way or the other, but broadly, uh, not much of an option but to consolidate. Right. So that's it from us today. Please stay tuned and watch out for more.